you. Now, would you join me in a word of prayer as we start our service? Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for what we celebrate this week, uh, the, the independence that we have, the freedoms that we have in this country. We are grateful for them. And we pray, Father, that as we worship you, we exalt you in every way that we can, understanding that you purchased the ultimate freedom for us as followers of Christ, as you free us from the powers of sin and death through what you've accomplished for us. Bless this time and use it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Chelsea? Oh, I'm on now. Hello. Good morning. Well, why don't we, oh, you're our name. Well, let's begin with worship. <laughs> Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the
It's that time of the month uh, that we celebrate the Lord's Supper here the very first Sunday of the month each year, each, each, each year, each month. I'll get that right in a minute. So I want to begin with reading some scripture to you, and then we'll enter into our time of observing the Lord's Supper as we are reminded of the sacrifice that our Savior gave for us for our salvation. It says in Luke's Gospel in chapter 22, beginning in verse 14, he says this. It says, when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And Jesus said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is a new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine at the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began discussing among themselves which one of them he might, it might be who was going to do this thing. Chris, would you lead us in a prayer for the elements at this time? Dear Lord, we just come down. We thank you for this time where we can come and observe this, this right that we have, dear Lord, as believers in you to know that you've died on the cross to save our sins and what the, the, the shedding of your blood and means for us all, dear Lord. And we come now and with open hearts, dear Lord, and, and, and repentive hearts, dear Lord, that, uh, of our sins that we've committed, and just lift them up to you, dear Lord, and again, just be with us as we take this time. In your precious name, amen. And then Jesus took the bread and said, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Same manner he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Remember that as often as you drink it, this do in remembrance of me. Okay. We'll now continue with our service. Chelsea? Will you stand as we continue to worship?
Good morning once again. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us, rather here in person or watching on our live stream, or for those of you who will watch it later, again, welcome. Um, as Tim had mentioned last week, we had um, several campers from our church membership, our Awana club, and Awana clubs around the area at camp this past week. Um, they had gone last Saturday. We picked them up yesterday morning, and uh, with picking up, uh, my oldest son was one of the ones going, and with picking him up yesterday, just seeing the relationships that are formed throughout the week between campers, between counselors and campers and staff, um, it's just amazing and wonderful to see what God can do, especially with the children in, in our, our future, basically. And just be in prayer now that as they've come back from camp, that they'll use what they've learned this week and take it out into the world and not be afraid to share that and, and to keep growing in their heart. Um, if you're a first time visitor with us, welcome um, as well, especially to you in, in the pew in front of you, there is a connection card. You can fill that out with your information and uh, drop it in the offering plate when it comes by here in just a few moments, um, or you can leave it on the pew, or you can also drop it on the way out when you leave. And for everybody on the backside, there is a spot for prayer requests, praises, updates, whatever it is you, you feel led that, that you need to put on that card. And again, if you drop it in the offering plate, when it comes by, somebody will be praying for that request during the service today and through the coming weeks. So I um, believe that's all I have for now. So if you'll join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we just come to you now. We lift up this part of the service where we're able to gather these offerings and uh, help spread your kingdom, dear Lord, and in the ways that you would have our church to use these offerings, dear Lord. And um, again, just with the furtherment of your kingdom and be with Mike as he comes and leads us now in the, in the time of looking at your word and in scripture, dear Lord, and what you've given to him to preach to us today. And um, just come with open hearts, open minds, and open ears, dear Lord, and uh, be receptive to what your word has to say today to us. And uh, lift up the rest of this service up to you in your precious son's name. Amen. As I said earlier, happy 4th to you a couple days early. It's hard to imagine. That's here already, which kind of means I guess summer's in full swing whether we like it or not, right? It's here. Uh, weather may not show that sometimes, but I imagine before long it will begin to demonstrate its reminder to us that summer is here as the heat comes, right? That's what we're all used to. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Amos chapter 4. We're continuing through the book of Amos. Uh, and I find this text uh, extremely interesting. There's a lot of things that I could say that I won't say because I don't have time to. There's a lot here. But uh, this is one of those texts that uh, uh, I find uh, very convicting, but also very reassuring in what God and his standard is for us. God's standards, you know, do not change. Our world changes. Our opinions change. But God's standards remain true. And I'm grateful for that. So let's look at Amos 4, beginning verse 1. If you're able, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word this morning? Amos 4, verses 1 through 13, to the end of the chapter. All right, here we go. And the prophet writes, he says, Hear, the word, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, Behold, the days are coming upon you. When they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through the breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. 
Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leaven, and proclaim freewill offerings to make known that for, to make them known. For so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I withheld rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but you would not be, sati- but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I smote you, smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from the blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the winds and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the words of the prophet. And I pray, Father, today as we walk through this text that you would use me to faithfully communicate your word to us today, that we might each hear what your spirit desires us to hear, to apply to our lives, to flesh out the love and grace you poured into us, and to live the lives of holiness and righteousness you've also called us to live in this world. Father, help us to stand firm upon your word and on your truth. May you live and walk through us as the Holy Spirit indwells us, empowers us, and uses us. Bless this time. And may you be exalted through all that is said and done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as I said, this is a very uh, interesting text with a lot in it. Uh, And like I said, there's going to be parts I'm going to miss. As I always say that every week, just to assure you, I'm not skipping them because I want to. I sometimes just can't cover it all. There's more here. This is one of those things I remember Back in the days of college, when I took an Old Testament class and we were doing the prophets, there was one class on the, that we did all the minor prophets and we went through the 12 minor prophets in this class for a semester, which was not enough time, with our Old Testament professor. We went into each of them in pretty great detail. You can do 12, divide it by 16 weeks and know that we at least got a whole week on each one, which was kind of interesting. But I remember the book of Amos specifically when my Old Testament professor, uh, who shared that with us and I've mentioned him before. His name was Dr. Claude Mariottini, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but he had a very, he was from Brazil, a Brazil native, and uh, had a very thick, I guess that would be Portuguese accent. I guess that's the language they speak in Brazil. And uh, he would speak with that, and so you had to listen very carefully uh, when Dr. Claude taught. But I, I learned over time, after having him for several classes, how to catch what he was saying and understand it. But I remember as he, he spent that over a week in the book of Amos, I can remember this passage, he seemed like we spent an entire day on because there's so much here and he just unfolded it for us. I will not give that to you this morning because you want to go home sometime today, right? But there, was, there is so much more here. There's so many things that are about that time that God is alluding to and reminding them, but also for those of us as followers of God who come much later, he's trying to remind us of the importance of preparing ourselves before him and making sure we understand that the day will come for all of us when we will meet our maker. We will stand before him in judgment. And that's what the heart of this is really, is that idea of preparing to meet him. And because of that, the children of Israel were struggling with some things. And we see that in here because there had grown in that culture something that I'm glad we don't struggle with today. There was a sense of entitlement among the Jewish believers, the Jewish people in that that world. They believed because they were the children of God, the chosen people of God, that whatever they did was fine with God. I'm so glad we don't do that today, right? But that was the struggle that they were dealing with. That, and you see that in the prophet, and you see that throughout other prophets as well, but specifically in the book of Amos, he's trying to remind them of that. He's, he's, he's talking to a specific group of people here. He's talking at the initial part, and I don't think that Amos ever took a class on tact and kindness. Do you? Because he starts off, I mean, (laughs) look at the first verse. What does he call? He's talking to the wives of the priests is who he's he's speaking to here specifically. 
Now, I don't know how it was in your growing up, but I don't think I was ever allowed to call a female a cow. How's that? That's not, that's not nice, is it? But he stakes, makes that statement about these women, and he calls them the cows of Bashan. He, he's saying, you, you, are, you have lost it. I mean, he's trying to insult them. He's trying to get their attention. And then he goes on to list the things they do that they, they do not serve. They, they oppose the, the poor. They crush the needy. You know, they want more and more and more. He's describing them. But he's saying a day of judgment is coming. And he gives a really disturbing picture here in, in that verse. Did you see what he said? He said, some of you they will take away with meat hooks and others with fish hooks. Now, I don't know what the size of those hooks are. I don't want to be taken away with a hook. But the, the nation that was responsible for the, that did these things often was the nation of Assyria that we talk about a lot in the scriptures. They were very harsh and cruel people. And when they took people away, they really didn't care what you felt about that. They took you away. And it, they were very cruel. And that was a way that they would do that. They would literally hook the people and line them up. Now, that sounds gross. It is. It's got to be, I can't imagine the pain of that. If you've ever had a fish hook stuck in your finger, anybody with me on that one? That hurts, okay? And that's just a little tiny fish hook. I don't think when they're talking about fish hooks, he's talking about little tiny hooks. What do you bet? And I also know when he talks about meat hooks, if you've ever been in a place where they do that, uh, you know what a meat hook is. It's a large hook. And this is what he's using to describe that. And you say, why are you thinking about this? But I think because this is a reminder of these people that God is tired of their self-centeredness. He is tired of their hypocrisy. And now he is going to bring judgment. And we know in history, he did bring judgment on the people of God. Uh, when the Assyrians came in, it was horrific. You know, the Babylonian captivity, we talk about that a lot. That was where they took the leadership out and took them to Babylon. But the Assyrians, who overwhelmed the Babylonians, were not as gracious and civilized as the Babylonians. They were cruel. And he's describing that and letting them know that's coming. Now, let's get out of that because that's just a lot of things to think about. But he talks about how they'll be taken away. And really the focus of the, the text really is going to come later, but he's really trying to help them understand why God is judging them. Now, I don't know if when you were a child you ever got in trouble for doing something you weren't supposed to do. Did that ever happen to anybody else? Okay. Uh, and I'm sure that your children never got in trouble. Well, I know your grandchildren didn't, for those of their grandparents, right? They never get in trouble, right? They're perfect angels, right? Ask their parents and you'll probably get a different story. But I mean, that's what we, we forget that. Now, we know a lot of times when we get in trouble... There's a reason why we get in trouble, correct? Our parents, our great, whoever is disciplined at the time, tell us, this is why you're going to get the discipline you're about to receive because of what you've done. That's just the way it works, right? That's how we discipline our children. It's kind of like when you get stopped on the side of the road by one of the, uh, you know, Maryland's finest for doing something you weren't supposed to do. They explain to you why this, isn't that the first question they ask? Do you know why I stopped you? Right? That's what the officer says. And, and you're like, uh, you know... Do you really want to answer that question? Because uh, you know, in your heart of hearts, you know what happened. You know the circumstance. Most of us know when we see the lights in the rearview mirror, why we see the lights in the rearview mirror. We know what has happened. And we don't want to admit it, but that's what happens. And so there's a reason behind it. And there's a reason behind God's judgment on his people in this text and in this entire book of Amos. Why he has had enough. And he's going to give those reasons later, but he's reminded them of their sin and their transgression. And, their, and yet they are still involved in their regular worship, and they are still living as if there's nothing going on in their lives. They are still consistent. He talks about that in verse 4. They enter Beth Bethel, if they transgress, and then Golgal, they multiply their transgression. And yet you bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes every three days. You, you do all the religious deeds. You do everything I've told you to do, but your hearts are not where they need to be, and your life is not focused on what it needs to be focused on. And you come to me with this half-hearted worship and half-hearted religious attitude and you expect me to be pleased and be ex and honored that you would join me in my presence. And you can almost hear the disdain through the prophet of God towards his people in the hypocrisy in which they worship. Because right, and many of them would go to the, the temple, they would go wherever it was to worship on their Saturdays, they would spend that time with God, and then throughout the week they would go to the high places that it talks about in the scriptures, where they would participate in idol worship, and all some of the activities that surrounded the various false gods and goddesses that they worship, some of them were extremely deplorable, they would do those things, and then show up on Sunday, like, or Saturday, excuse me, like everything was good. 
Now, I am so glad we don't have any kind of hypocrisy like that in the church of Jesus Christ today. Amen? Why didn't I get an amen on that? Because we do. We can be very content to think that as long as we give God our Sunday attendance and our Sunday participation, that God will be pleased with us when what God is really wanting is not what we do in here on Sunday morning, but how you and I live our lives outside of these four walls. That our faith is lived out and fleshed out. That our lives are lived surrendered to Him. That we understand that what we do here is a gathering. It is important. It helps us in our faith. But what we do outside of here demonstrates the validity and the depth and the integrity of what we are doing in our faith. Because most of us, I think, have a thing where we despise hypocrisy, don't we? I think we do. We don't like it. We don't like seeing it. We don't like seeing it in others. And when we see it in ourselves, as the children of Israel are seeing it here quite clearly, it frustrates us. And it means there's, there's a disconnect somewhere between what God has called them to do or God has called us to do and what we are actually doing. And that's at the heart of hypocrisy. And we see it throughout history. We see it throughout the history of the church. We see it today in the church. And yet I believe God wants so much more and deserves so much more from us than a half-hearted devotion, as we're seeing here, as he's describing here. And he goes on to lay it out what it looks like. In the following verses, he starts there in verse 5 and begins to, to tell them, some things. He says, the thank offering, you affirm, all these things you do, you proclaim free will offerings, you make them known. You love to do this, declares the Lord. And then it shows what God does to try and get their attention. Because if you notice that in your own life, I hope you, you probably experienced this, whenever we're not living according to what God desires, God tries to get our attention. That happen to anybody else? He, he does something. Maybe it's a word you hear, or maybe it's something that happens in your life, and he's trying to draw you back to himself. The, the struggles that we often face are not because we make mistakes. A lot of times, as followers of Christ, I believe God is trying to get our attention back. He's trying to help us see, okay, you're heading down the wrong path. I need you to go this way. This is not where I want you to be. And I think he's been trying to do that for the church of Jesus Christ in the United States for decades, maybe centuries. And yet we, we continue to follow the same path we've always done. Aren't we good Baptists? But the heart of that is a heart that is strained from him, which we see in this text. A heart that is not focused on him, and yet God is doing this. Notice what he says in verse 6. I gave you cleanness of teeth. Now, he's not talking about dental hygiene. He's talking about starvation. I made it difficult for you. I, you weren't having any food. I gave that in your, a lack of bread in all your places. I did all these things. And what does he say then at the end of that verse? Yet you have not returned to me. You didn't recognize that this was me doing this to you. You just thought, oh, we're having a bad day or a bad week, or a bad month. Things just happen. But God has a purpose. He's trying to draw them back. And then he says in verse 7, Furthermore, I withheld rain from you. You know, God has the power to do that. Did you know that? He can bring rain, or he can withhold rain. He's in charge of the elements and the environment. They are not beholden to him. You know, he doesn't have to wait to you know, to do what they do. He can control them. He can change things. He can do whatever, because he created, you forget, he created the elements. He created everything that we experience and see in this life. He is our creator and the creator of all that is. And he tells them that I, I withheld the rain for three months, right before harvest, the most important time. And those of you that grow crops better than me, which is everybody in this room, you, you understand that there's a time for that rain to come that's best for the crops, right? And right at the time they needed it was the time they didn't get it. So it, it created dryness. It created loss. And there would be rain one place and not in another. I did all these things. And what? You still didn't return to me. He talks about how two or three would stagger. They would stagger from cities to, to other cities that had water. And yet they wouldn't return to God. They ignored what God was doing. Is this beginning to sound familiar? He then talks about smoting them with the, the scorching wind and the mildew. And the caterpillar was devouring their many gardens, fig trees, olive trees, everything that they had planted. And yet, once again, that same chorus, you have not returned to me. 
And then he talks about something as a reminder. He says, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men with, by the sword and, I, and your captured horses. I made a stench of your camp up in its nostrils. Death was everywhere. And yet, you have not returned to me. And in verse 11, he reminds them again. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Anybody remember in the Bible, in Genesis? Was that a good experience for Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, that was pretty bad. Fire and brimstone, the scripture says. I mean, God destroyed the cities because of their sin and their rebellion and their self-centeredness, their focus on themselves. He wiped them out. And, you know, Lot and his wife, they got away, and then she turned back and looked. You know the story. You've read it in the scriptures. And he's reminded, I'm going to, I'm, what I did to them, I did to you. He says, you were like, I love this, a firebrand snatched from the blaze. Almost gone, engulfed, and yet saved at the last moment. And yet, there's that line again, you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. What is God doing in us and through us as the people of God, trying to draw us back to himself in this land? Now, this was what happened a long time ago, long before any of us were around. But I want us to think about what are we doing? What is God doing where he's trying to get our attention, trying to say, I want you to turn back to me and quit following after the things that others tell you to follow or your own will, your own wishes. Trust me that I am God. Why do you seek after other things and other gods and goddesses instead of following me, the one Lord God of heaven who loves you and has done everything for you? Because that same struggle exist in humanity today. We have this desire to serve and love our Creator, but we also have this desire to be in control and have things the way we want them, don't we? Oh yeah, we do. How many of us like being out of control? Yeah, I thought that would happen. We like to know, because like today, you know what's going to happen today, right? You got a plan of what you're going to do. You're going to come, you came to church, you came to Bible study for so many of you, then you're in worship together, you're listening to the crazy guy talk, you're doing all these things, and you're going to go home this afternoon, and what's the first thing we're all going to do? Probably when we get home pretty much, we're going to have lunch. And this being, although it's, it's a weird, it's not really a holiday weekend because the holiday's not till Tuesday, but a lot of folks were gathering. We had a huge gathering in the park behind us yesterday. I'm assuming it was a family gathering. I don't know, it was a lot of people here last night that were gathered in the park, and they were eating, and uh, as I came through the park, I you know, went up there early in the morning, shoot some baskets, came through. Man, it smelled really good. They had a couple big grills out there. I don't know what they were cooking, but it smelled good. They didn't ask me to stay, so I didn't want to bother them. But anyway, they were, it was, it, it, they were having a good time, which is good, and there was a lot of people there, and that happens a lot, and that's good. That's kind of what we do. What do we do to celebrate our nation's independence? We eat food, and we blow stuff up. That's what we do. That's the American way, right? That's... that's because, you know, that's what's going to happen over the next several days. If it hasn't already, it's already started in our neighborhood. It'll probably start in yours across the, the place. We'll have little exploding devices shot off around, and it'll drive the fire department crazy. But that's what we do, right? It's the American way, and that's part of the way we celebrate it. But sometimes we get caught up in the way things are, the way things we think should be, and miss what God wants much like the nation of Israel here, the people of God. Everything was going the way they wanted it to go. Everything seemed to be okay, but yet they were distracted. They didn't realize that God wanted more of them than they were willing to give him. Because I believe one of the struggles of the church in our world today, and maybe in, in America especially, is many followers of Christ, many believers, many I'm going to pick on Baptists because I've been one my whole life, so it doesn't matter. I guess I can do that. Even before I was a Christian, I was a Baptist. So we, we believe that as long as we do a few things, God is pleased. And yet God wants more than our token obedience and our religious observances and activity. He wants us. He wants us fully devoted to him, surrendered to him, allowing him to be the Lord God of our lives, expressing our love for him, living out what he has told us to live, being the men and women of God he has recreated us to be, all those things. He wants us completely. 
And we see through this text that the struggle of the people, how they had heard from God and God had reminded them and yet they rejected God's judgment and they thought they didn't, I guess they ignored it, didn't realize it. You know, I'm pretty sure when I got punished for my sin growing up, I remembered it, at least for a day or two, right? And yet, as followers of Christ sometimes, and followers of God, we forget when God is trying to discipline us. There is, and it's, God's discipline isn't just to discipline us because he wants to hurt us. That's not the purpose. There is a plan for it. Much like as a parent, when you discipline your child, there's a reason you discipline your child, right? You don't just do it because, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. You do it because you love your child and you're trying to help your child develop the characteristics that she or he needs to have to become a responsible adult, right? That's our goal. We want to help them understand some things, that this is the way you live, this is the way you conduct yourselves, that that is not appropriate. And I think our God is trying to do that with his people, saying this is the way I want you to live, I'm trying to help you understand that. And the purpose of the discipline is not just to make us feel bad or to hurt us, it's corrective, it's redemptive. God is trying to move us on that path to help us understand, you need to do this because I love you and I've told you this He's, he's a loving parent. He's trying to help us see that. But all too often, like the people in the text that I just read, and we see that again and again in the land of Israel and the, and the people of God, the people of Judah, throughout the prophets, they talk about that. They, they see it, and for a while they see it, and they go back to the old way, the way that feels comfortable to them, the way that feels good to them, the way that, that fits, feels the emotional need that they think they have. They're, they're, they're happy, they're good, so all right, everything's okay with me, and I don't care what God thinks anymore. They wouldn't say that out loud, but that's what they're thinking. One of the most disturbing visions of that for me as a person that I can remember, there's a lot of things I remember, but this one in particular was, how many of you remember 9-11? Remember that day? I mean, how will you forget that day? I mean, it's been over 20, 22 years ago it'll be September, is that right? Wow, it's been that long. But I bet if we go around the room, for those of us that are older, we can remember exactly where we were when we heard the news. It's kind of like my parents used to talk about growing up. They remembered when they heard the news of President Kennedy being shot. They, they knew exactly what they were doing. They, they remember that. Some of you might remember that as well. You, you knew that there's just a, it's, a, it's like a moment frozen in time for us. We remember it. And I remember what happened after that. I remember how churches were filled. And I remember even seeing the Congress celebrate that. I mean, the, the Congress in session, exalting and honoring God. That doesn't make any sense, Right? Not those, those people right now. But there was, a, there was a movement, it seemed like, back to God, an understanding of who our creator was. And we were grateful to him for what he, who he was. And we were beginning to understand where our need for him. And then just a few weeks, months later, we're back in the same old stuff. Boy, that looks a lot like these folks in their day. There are not a lot of differences. You know, people don't change much. Over the last thousand, several thousand years, we have that same struggle. They went back to it. And that's why they needed the prophets to come in. People like Amos and Malachi and Micah and all these different, Hosea, all these different prophets that we've looked at and you can, you can read about in the scriptures that came and Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel to tell them this is not the way. This is the way that God has told you to live, brothers and sisters. You need to change. You need to repent. And they're like, okay. And they repent for a while and they go back. It's kind of like when I was going to church as a kid, our church had revivals twice a year. Anybody remember those days? I think we had more than that at Calvary. I think we had them like four times a year, it seemed like. We always joked that our pastor needed more Sundays off from preaching. But anyway, we'd have all these revivals. And I remember you'd have these times, you'd have everybody coming in. I can remember seeing people that I never saw before at revival meeting, which is okay, that's good. I like seeing people I've never seen before. I didn't know they were connected to our church, my little church there in my hometown, but they were there. And we'd have these big crowds I'm sure Brother Charles would have loved to have had the crowds that we had at revival meetings sometimes throughout the week. It was usually Sunday night through Fridays. You know, the Friday was always a little sparser than the rest of them, but it was a, a full week. And I remember people going down the aisles. I can see, te- I can remember tears. I can remember people repenting, people apologizing. A lot of things happened. And we really thought that our church maybe in that moment would turn a corner. But then a month or two later, Here we are again, same place, same struggles. We forgot what God has done. Now, why do I share that silly little story? Because I think that's what we do as the people of God, don't we? 
We get all focused. We know where we're supposed to be. And then we go back to the way things were. And much like we d- I described a few moments ago of what happened to our land after what we experienced in 9-11 and that unity and that focus on God. And then now, I don't think you could say we have unity and a focus on God in America today. Is that fair? I don't think we do. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see that in this land. And I wondered as I I walked through this text this week, because that 12th verse just, you know, you read verses hundreds of times in the scriptures and you read them and, and then all of a sudden that verse just jumped out at me. It's really the core of this text and the Really, uh, it's a huge verse in the book of Amos. When he said, For therefore thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do the, to this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. There are a lot of things in life that are a little bit disconcerting, frightening, foreboding, not I'm really looking forward to doing, But I would think the one thing that any of us would be a little bit taken aback by would be the reality that one day we will meet our God. Unfiltered, unshielded, we will stand before the Almighty, the King of glory, the Lord of of lords, the creator of all that is. We will stand before him. And he is reminding the people that day is coming very soon for you. Turn your hearts while you still can. Turn with me for a second to Joel, which if you have your Bible, it's the book right before Amos. You got it with you. We're going to look at just a couple of verses that you've probably heard before. 11 and 12 are the verses we're going to look at. And then the book of Joel is another one of the minor prophets And he's talking about a lot of things. I believe this is the one Locke talks about the the invasion of the locusts is really the focus of that book, but we're not going to get into that. But what he says in Joel 2, 11 and 12, he says, The Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great. For strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome, and who can endure it? Verse 12, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me, with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. And the end in verse 13 will go a little farther. And you rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. As I think of that text, and I think of the text we're looking at, and I think of us as the church of Jesus Christ and in our land. And because, folks, a lot of people complain, well, what's wrong with America? You know, why has she turned her back from God? Why is she not focused on God as a land? That's the church's fault. I'm going to say it. That lays at the, the feet of the body of Christ. And when I say church, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about the church as a whole. The body of believers, that is at our feet. Because the spiritual health of America is not rested in the hands of the United States government, hallelujah. It rests in the hearts and minds of the people of God in the church of Jesus Christ in this land as we are spread across this land in various churches, various places across. That is where it lies. And so the health, the spiritual health of our land depends upon us as followers of Christ. And so when I look at the spiritual health of America and I see what's going on, I'm disturbed and I'm also heartbroken because I know I'm at fault. Now we can look other ways and I love to read, you know, experts and people that do polls and and try and figure out why this is going on. And they're nice and they have some wonderful insights. But at the core of it, I really believe it's pretty simple. It has to do with me and you. Those of us that follow Christ, doesn't it? Is there something not what it needs to be in my walk, evidently there must be. Now, I'm not trying to create a a sense of guilt 
or pain and anguish in any way here. I'm just being as honest as I can with this text because that's what is needed, as, as we said in Joel, what Joel says is needed. And what Amos is saying today is needed is a sense of turning back to God and understanding what God is trying to do in us and saying, okay, God, you are right about the things in my life that need to change. You are right. That's part where repentance starts. God, you are right. I am wrong. Before we came to Christ, for those of us that came to Christ, what was one of the first things we had to recognize? What's the first thing you have to recognize before you come to Christ in salvation? I am a what? Sinner. I am separated from God. It doesn't matter how many times I've been to church. It doesn't matter how good I am and how nice I am to other people. God doesn't keep a checklist of saying, well, they were good seven times and bad five times. Okay, that's good. Doesn't work that way. God's checklist is a little different than mine. I mean, that works real well in the, scout, the scales of justice as they're interpreted. You know, you can kind of, in our minds. But the reality is one act against his will nullifies all my goodness. It's gone. And I'm going to be honest. Now, I don't know. I'm not going to ask you to tell me this. I've, I've committed more than one act of sin in my life. Is that fair? I don't think I'm alone in that. But I can't speak for you, okay? But I know that I have. And so I know there's a, there's a deficiency there. Is that a fair thing to say? There's something that needs to be corrected in that. And what's amazing is though it takes, you know how many sins it takes to send you to hell? One. That's all it takes. One. But you know what? No matter how many sins we have committed, no matter how much vileness and sin and wickedness and self-centeredness is in our heart, one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ can change everything. One drop. How many drops of blood did it take to save humanity? One. He shed it all, but it only took one. Because of the power of that blood and the power of the Savior and what he was able to do, that is why we can Humbly come before him and know that, that even though we failed, even though we haven't lived up to expectations, and brothers and sisters, we can all relate to that. Though God is just and righteous and holy and justified when he punishes and when he does the things that he needs to do to correct us, praise God, he is also merciful. Amen? Anybody thankful for God's mercy today? I'm just curious, besides me. Because without his mercy, <laughs> I got no chance. I mean, zero, it isn't even close. There's nothing. I got nothing. I know when I stand before the throne of judgment, I've got nothing to say. I, Jesus, that's it. That's all I got. He doesn't care that I was a pastor. He doesn't care that what I've done, all those things that I've done, I've tried to live. That doesn't mean what matters is my walk with Christ, is what Christ has done for me that nullifies everything awful and evil in me and in you. Isn't that wonderful? Did you ever think about that for a minute? That's the power of what our king has done. And to receive that, now this is the important part, to receive that, we don't just say, oh, wow, that's great. The scriptures have a clear path to that, don't they? They talk about repentance. Scriptures do. Surrender. All those things are in it. I, that's part of the, you know, that sinner's prayer, we call it, and, and that's not a magical prayer, but the idea of it is that you are understanding your will and your heart that I am a sinner, I have sinned against God, and there is nothing I can do to save myself. So I throw myself on the mercy of the cross and what Jesus has done for me. And the only hope I have is what Jesus Christ has done for me, right? That's all I got. And much like our brothers and sisters in this text that we're looking at, they had gotten distracted. They had gotten caught up in all the things that they did that they thought were important and forgotten that what God wanted from them, as I said earlier, and I think the scriptures are pretty clear, God wants you. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your religious devotion. That's fine. He wants you, body, soul, mind, and spirit. He wants you completely. And that's why it's so essential, I think, for all of us. And for folks, I'd love to say before, I'd love to stand for today and say, I've got it all figured out and taken all care of, but I'd be lying if I said that. 
Because that's not true. It is a daily struggle. It is something I walk through on a regular basis, and probably all of us will. Probably to the day that we meet him, we will be struggling with that. We'll be trying to let go of controlling our lives and letting him have control. We know it's best, but there's just something about us that says, no, I think I know better. And yet here we are. And so my, my hope for us today in this, why, as I looked at all these things that I, I've shared, and I probably shared more than you thought I wanted to, or that you wanted to hear anyway. I'm too bad, sorry. I think verse 13 reminds us of who we follow, doesn't it? And who we serve. Let me read that to you, and we're going to close with this. And, and, and Amos writes this, and he says it so well. It says, for behold, he who forms the mountains, creates the wind, and declares to man what are his thoughts. He who makes the dawn into darkness, he who treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. And as Isaiah says so plainly and clearly, and like him there is no other. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the words of the prophet as he shared those with us. And I pray, Father, that today I have been faithful to his word and his call upon our lives and what he was saying to his people then. And, Father, what he continues to say to us as his people today. And I pray, Father, that you will continue to move us to where you want us to be. And, Father, that we will continue to allow you to do in and through us whatever it is you desire. That our, we, will, we will surrender our will, our hearts, and our minds to you so that you can have your way in us. To use us as the men and women of God you have recreated us to be. Father, there are times we fail, times we struggle. But the amazing thing about your grace and your mercy... And what you've accomplished for us is that you keep calling us back. You keep encouraging us to come back. Just like you did with the children of Israel. How many times in that text did you mention, you've done all these things and yet you didn't turn to me. And yet you call us today, turn to me. And if there is one father in the, within the sound of my voice, either here present or watching in this uh, live stream that we're having or whomever, Father, that needs to respond to you, I pray that today would be the day that that individual, man, woman, boy, or girl would surrender their life to you to follow Christ and allow you to be Lord of their life, accept the, the sacrifice, the mercy, the salvation that comes through Christ and Christ alone that can change any one of us. Thank you, Lord, for that incredible work and gift. Bless this time. May you be exalted and glorified by whatever is accomplished, for you are Lord over all. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.